Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for regathering in this uh, rich realm we call Torah, so that we can explore the wisdom of the text and the wisdom that lies within each one of us. We are in Parshat Bechalotecha, which is in the book of Numbers, uh, chapter 8, beginning with verse 1. We'll read through the English translation of our Torah portion, then I'll share with you a little bit of a focus study on it, and then we'll open it up to our collective conversation about the Torah portion. If you'd like to go ahead and unmute at this time, we can share in saying the blessing, giving thanks for this moment. Baruch Adonai. Thank you, God, for the opportunity to immerse ourselves in words, deeds, and relationships of Torah. I'll share with you the opening verses, and then I'll invite others of you to have the opportunity to read some verses as well. Adonai spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and say to him, When you mount the lamps, let the seven lamps give light at the front of the lampstand. Aaron did so. He mounted the lamps at the front of the lampstand, as Adonai had commanded Moses. Now this is how the lampstand was made. It was hammered work of gold, hammered from base to petal. According to the pattern that Adonai has shown Moses, so was the lampstand made. Uh, verse five, Richard, would you like to read a little bit at verse five? Yes, thank you. And, uh, and they offered the Passover sacrifice. This is uh, chapter eight, verse five. Chapter eight, verse five, sorry. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, take the Levites from among the Israelites and cleanse them. This is what shall shall do to the, what you shall do to them to cleanse them. Sprinkle on them water of purification and let them go over their whole body with a razor and wash their clothes. Thus shall they be cleansed. Let them take a bull of the herd and with it a meal offering of choice flour with oil mixed in and you take a second bull of the herd for a sin offering. You shall bring the Levites forward before the tent of meeting, assemble the whole Israelite community, and bring the Levites forward before the Lord. Let the Israelites lay their hands upon the Levites, and let Aaron designate the Levites before the Lord as a wave offering from the Israelites, that they may perform the service of the Lord. The Levites shall now lay their hands upon the heads of the bulls. One shall be offered to the Lord as a sin offering and the other as a burnt offering to make expiation for the Levites. Thank you. And Margo, would you like to read starting at chapter 8, verse 13? Yes, thank you. You shall place the Levites in attendance upon Aaron and his sons and designate them as an elevation offering to the Lord. Thus you shall set the Levites apart from the Israelites, and the Levites shall be mine. Thereafter the Levites shall be qualified for the service of the tent of meeting. Once you have cleansed them and designate, designated them as an elevation offering, for they are formally assigned to me among the Israelites. Um, among the Israelites, I have taken them for myself in place of the first issue of the womb of all the firstborn of the Israelites. For every firstborn among Israelites, man as well as beast, is mine, and I consecrate them to myself at the time that I, that I smote every firstborn in the land of Egypt. Now I have now I take the Levites instead of every firstborn of the Israelites. And, and from among the Israelites, I formally assign the Levites to Aaron and his sons to perform the service of, for the Israelites in the tent of meeting and to make expiation for the Israelites so that no plague may affect the Israelites for coming too near 
the sanctuary. Thank you, Margo. So now we're on chapter eight, verse 20. And June, would you like to read starting there? There we go. I couldn't unmute. Thank you, Rabbi. Okay. Um, Moses, Aaron, and the whole Israelite community did with the Levites accordingly, just as the Lord had commanded Moses in regard to the Levites. So the Israelites did with them. The Levites purified themselves and washed their clothes, and Aaron designated them as an elevation offering before the Lord. And Aaron made expiation for them to cleanse them. Thereafter, the Levites were qualified to perform this service in a tent of meeting under Aaron and his sons. As the Lord had commanded Moses in regard to the Levites, so they did to them. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, this is the rule for the Levites. From 25 years of age and up, they shall participate in the workforce in the service of the tent of meeting. But at the age of 50, they shall retire from the workforce and shall serve no more. They may assist their brother Levites at the tent of meeting by standing guard, but they shall perform no labor. Thus you shall deal with the Levites in regard to their duty. Thank you. And Jim, would you like to read at the very start of chapter nine? Thank you, Rabbi. Adonai spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai on the first new moon of the second year following the exodus from the land of Egypt, saying, let the Israelite people offer the Passover sacrifice at its set time. You shall offer it on the 14th day of this month at twilight at its set time. You shall offer it in accordance with all its rules and rites. Moses instructed the Israelites to offer the Passover sacrifice and they offered the Passover sacrifice in the first month on the 14th day of the month at twilight in the wilderness of Sinai, just as Adonai had commanded Moses, so the Israelites did. But there were some men who were unclean by re reason of a corpse and could not offer the Passover sacrifice on that day. Appearing that same day before Moses and Aaron, these men said to them, Unclean though we are, by reason of a corpse, why must we be de de debarred from presenting Adonai's offering at its set time with the rest of the Israelites? Moses said to them, stand by and let me hear what instructions Adonai gives about you. Thank you, Jim. Let me invite Mark Thompson. Would you like to continue there at verse 9 of chapter 9? Yes, thank you. And Adonai spoke to Moses, saying... Speak to the Israelite people, saying, when any of you or of your posterity who are defiled by a corpse or are on a long journey would offer a Passover sacrifice to Adonai, they shall offer it in the second month on the 14th day of the month at twilight. They shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs, and they shall not leave any of it over until morning. They shall not break a bone of it. They shall offer it in strict accord with the law of the Passover sacrifice. But if a man who is clean and not on a journey refrains from offering the Passover sacrifice, that person shall be cut off from his kin, for he did not present Adonai's offering at its set time. That man shall bear his guilt. And when a stranger who resides with you would offer a Passover sacrifice to Adonai, he must offer it in accordance with the rules and rights of the Passover sacrifice. There shall be one law for you, whether stranger or citizen of the country. Thank you. And Robin, would you like to continue there with verse 15 of chapter nine? Sure, thank you. Is it just a coincidence? This is the part of this Parsha that I chanted. <laughs> it's, it's the universe just speaking, that's all. I know. On the day that the tabernacle was set up, the cloud covered the tabernacle, the tent of the pact. And in the evening, it rested over the tabernacle in the likeness of fire until morning. It was always so. The cloud covered it, appearing as fire by night. And whenever the cloud lifted from the tent, the Israelites would set out accordingly. 
and at the spot where the cloud settled, there the Israelites would make camp. At a command of Adonai, the Israelites broke camp, and at a command of Adonai, they made camp. They remained encamped as long as the cloud stayed over the tabernacle. When the cloud lingered over the tabernacle many days, the Israelites observed Adonai's mandate and did not journey on. At such times as the cloud rested over the tabernacle for but a few days, they remained encamped at a command of Adonai and broke camp at a command of Adonai. And at such times as the cloud stayed from evening until morning, they broke camp as soon as the cloud lifted in the morning. Day or night, whenever the cloud lifted, they would break camp, whether it was two days or a month or a year, however long the cloud lingered over the tabernacle, the Israelites remained encamped and did not set out. Only when it lifted did they break camp. On a sign from Adonai, they made camp, and on a sign from Adonai, they broke camp. They observed Adonai's mandate at Adonai's bidding through Moses. Thank you. And Paul, would you like to read at the very start of chapter 10? Thank you, Rabbi. Hashem spoke to Moses, saying, Make for yourself two silver trumpets. The, uh, the make, the, make them hammered out. And they shall be yours for the summoning of the assembly and to cause the camps to journey. When they sound a long blast with them, the entire assembly shall assemble to you, to the entrance of the tent of the meeting. If they sound a long blast with one, the leaders shall assemble to you, the heads of Israel's thousands. When you, when you sound short blasts, the camps resting to the east shall journey. When you sound short blasts a second time, the camps resting to the south shall journey. Short blasts shall they sound for their journeys. When you gather together the congregation, you shall sound a long blast, but not a short blast. The sons of Aaron, the Kohanim, they shall sound the trumpets, and it shall be for you an eternal decree for your generations. When you go to wage war in your land against an enemy who oppresses you, you shall sound short blasts of the trumpets, and you shall be recalled before Hashem your God, and you shall be saved from your foes. On the day of your gladness and on your festivals, and on your new moons, you shall sound the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over your feast peace offerings. And they shall be and there and they shall be a remembrance for you before our God. I am Hashem, your God. Thank you. And David and Susan, would you like to read starting at verse 11 of chapter 10? Yeah, since we get over the difference in our translations from what his translation and recover, we're ready to go. Especially with the different readers. <laughs> well, where yours say short, ours says long. Well, yours says long, mine says blast. So, <laughs> And it happened in the second year, in the second month, on the 20th of the month, that the cloud lifted from the tabernacle of the covenant. And the Israelites began on their journeys from the wilderness of Sinai, and the cloud abided in the wilderness of Paran. And they journeyed on from the first by the word of the Lord through the hand of Moses. And the banner of the camp of the Judah Judahites journeyed first by their divisions and over its division. Nashon, son of Aminadab, and over the division of the tribe of the Israelites. Issacharites, Nathanael son of Zuar, and over the division of the tribe of Zebul Zebulonites, Eliab son of Helon. And the tabernacle was taken down, and the Gershonites and the Merarites, the bearers of the tabernacle, journeyed on. And the banner of the camp of Reuben by their divisions journeyed on and over its division. Elazur, son of Shadur, and over the division of the tribe of Simeonites, Shalumiel, son of Zerishadai, 
and over the division of the tribe of Gadites, Eliasaph, son of Jewel, and the Koth Kohathites, the bearers of the sanctuary, journeyed on, and they would set up the tabernacle by the time they came. And the flag of the camp of the children of Ephraim by their armies traveled. And over its army was Elishama, son of Amahud. And over the army of the tribe of the children of Manasseh was Gamliel, son of Bedashur. Bedashur. And over the army of the tribe of the children of Benjamin was Abidan, son of Gideoni. And the flag of the camp of the children of Dan, the final of one of all the camps, by their armies traveled. And over its army was Ahiazar, uh, son of Amishadai. And over the army of the tribe of the children of Asher was Pagiel, son of Okran. And over the army of the tribe of the children of Naphtali was Ahira, son of Enon. These were the orders of travel of the children of Israel by their armies when they traveled. Thank you so much, both of you. And Robert, would you like to read a little bit beginning at verse 29? Yes, thank you. And Moses said unto Hobab, the son of Raghul, the Midianite, Moses' father-in-law, we are journeying unto the place of which the Lord said, I will give it to you. Come thou with us and we will do thee good, for the Lord hath spoken good concerning Israel. And he said unto him, I will not go, but I will depart to my own land and to my kindred. And he said, leave us not, I pray thee, for as much as thou knowest how we are to encamp in the wilderness, and thou mayest be to us instead of eyes. And it shall be, if thou go with us, yea, it shall be that with goodness the Lord shall do unto us. The same will we do unto thee. And they departed from the mount of the Lord three days journey. And the ark of the covenant of the Lord went before them in the three days journey to search out a resting place for them. And the cloud of the Lord was upon them by day when they went out of the camp. And it came to pass when, on, when the ark set forward that Moses said, Rise up, Lord, and let thine enemies be scattered, and let them that hate thee flee before thee. And when it rested, he said, Return, O Lord, unto the many thousands of Israel. Thank you so much. And Michael, would you like to read a little bit at the very start of chapter 11? Uh, the people looked to seeking complaints. It was evil in the ears of Hashem, and Hashem heard, and his wrath flared, and a fire of Hashem burned against them, and it consumed at the edge of the camp. The people cried out to Moses. Moses prayed to Hashem, and the fire died down. He named that place T Tabera, for the fire of Hashem had burned against them. The rabble that was among them cultivated a craving, and the children of Israel also wept once more and said, Who will feed us meat? We remember the fish that we ate in Egypt free of charge, the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlic. But now our life is parched. There's nothing. We have nothing to anticipate but the manna. Now, the manna was the coriander seed, and its color was like the color of the bedolach. The people would stroll and gather it and grind it in a mill or pound it in a mortar and cook it in a pot or make it into cakes. And its taste was like the taste of dough kneaded with oil. When the dew descended upon the camp at night, the manna would descend upon it. Moses heard the people weeping in their family groups, each one at the entrance of his tent, and the wrath of Hashem flared greatly, and in the eyes of Moses, it was bad. Moses said to Hashem, why have you done evil to your servant? Why have I not found favor in your eyes that you placed the burden of this entire people upon me? Did I, uh, did I conceive this entire people or did I give birth to it? that you say to me, carry them in your bosom 
as a nurse carries a suckling to the Lord that you swore to its forefathers? Where shall I get meat to give them uh, uh, to give to this entire people when they weep to me, saying, "Give us meat that we may eat." I alone cannot carry this entire nation, for it's too heavy for me. And if this is how you deal with me, then kill me now. If I have found favor in your eyes, and let me not see my evil. Thank you so much, Michael. And Justin, would you like to read beginning at verse 16? Then the Lord said to Moses, Assemble for me 70 men of the elders of Israel whom you know to be the people's elders and officers, and you'll take them to the tent of meeting, and they shall stand there with you. I will come down and speak with you there, and I will increase the spirit that is upon you and bestow it upon them, and they'll bear the burden of the people with you, so you need not bear it alone. And to the people you shall say, Prepare yourselves for tomorrow, and you shall eat meat, because you have cried out in the ears of the Lord, saying, You will feed us meat, for we had it better in Egypt. Therefore the Lord will give you meat, and you shall eat. You shall eat it not one day, not two days, not five days, not ten days, and not twenty days, but even for a full month until it comes out of your nose and nauseates you because you have despised the Lord who is among you. And you cried before him saying, why did we ever leave Egypt? Moses said 600,000 people on foot are the people in whose midst I am. And you say, I will give them meat and they will eat it for a full month. If sheep and cattle were slaughtered for them, it would suffice for them. If all the fish in the sea were gathered for them, would it suffice for them? Then the Lord said to Moses, Is my power limited? Now you will see if my word comes true for you or not. Moses went out and told the people what the Lord had said, and he assembled 70 men of the elders of the people and stood around them around the tent. The Lord descended in a cloud and spoke to him, and he increased some of the spirit that was on him and bestowed it on the 70 elders. And when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied, but they did not continue. Now two men remained in the camp. The name of one was Eldad, and the name of the second was Medad, and the spirit rested upon them. They were among those written, but they did not go out to the tent, but prophesied in the camp. The lad ran and told Moses, saying, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' servant from his youth, answered and said, Moses, my master, imprisoned them. Moses said to him, Are you zealous for my sake? If only all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would bestow his spirit upon them. Then Moses entered the camp, he and the elders of Israel. Thank you so much. So let me invite, uh, thank you. And let me invite Catherine, would you like to read starting at verse 31? Thank you, Rabbi. A wind from the Lord started up, swept quail from the sea, and strewed them over the camp about a day's journey on this side and about a day's journey on that side, all around the camp, and some two cubits deep on the ground. The people said to gathering quail all that day, night and night, and all the next day, even he who gathered the least had 10 homers, and they spread them out all, over, all around the camp. The meat was still between their teeth, nor yet chewed, when the anger of the Lord blazed forth against the people, and the Lord struck the people with a very severe plague. 
that place was named Kibroth Hatava because the people who had the craving were buried there. Then the people set out from Kibroth Hatava for Hazaroth. When they were in Hazaroth, Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman he had married. He married a Cushite. Yes. So, and then let me invite uh, Jay, would you like to continue reading at verse 2 of chapter 12? Verse 2 of chapter 12. They said, has the Lord spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us as well? Adonai heard it. Now Moses was a very humble man, more so than any other man on earth. Suddenly Adonai called to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, come out you three, to the tent of meeting. So the three of them went out. Hashem came down in a pillar of cloud, stopped at the entrance of the tent and called out, Aaron and Miriam. The two of them came forward and he said, hear these my words. When a prophet of Adonai rises among you, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is trusted throughout my household. With him I speak mouth to mouth plainly and not in riddles as he beholds the likeness of yod heh vav -He. How then did you not shrink from speaking against my servant Moses? Still incensed with them, Adonai departed. Continue? Yes, please. As the cloud withdrew from the tent, there was Miriam stricken with snow white scales when Aaron turned toward Miriam, he saw that she was stricken with scales. And Aaron said to Moshe, Oh, my Lord, account not to us the sin which we committed in our folly. Let, let her not be as one dead who emerges from his mother's womb with half his flesh eaten away. So Moses cried out, cried out to Adonai saying, Oh, God, pray, heal her. But Adonai said to Moses, if her father spat in her face, would she not bear her shame for seven days? Let her be shut out of camp for seven days and let, then let her be readmitted. So Miriam was shut out of camp seven days and the people did not march on until Miriam was readmitted. After that, the people went out from Hazarot and encamped in the wilderness of Paran. Thank you all very much. I'm just so very grateful for all of your readings. I have to say there were things um, I had not seen before in this Torah portion un until we engaged in our uh, collective reading. So thank you all very much for helping me to, to see new things in this week's portion. I'd like to share with you a little bit of a focused study and then we'll open up for our, our joint conversation. Our Torah portion uh, opens up with a description of the menorah. And so I, I kind of stayed there for a little bit and thought a lot about the menorah. If you have your study sheet, you can take it out and you'll see a, a painting by the Israeli artist Yoram Ra'anan uh, of the menorah. And as I was uh, thinking about um, the, the menorah and the light it brings forth, I thought about uh, two other stories. Uh, they are midrashim that uh, have to do with lights. And they, they both, deal with uh, Abraham. And one uh, I I I I version, uh, both of them have to do with this opening verse from uh, our introduction to, to Abraham in chapter 12 in the book of Genesis, verse one, God said to Abram, go forth from your native land. And of course, a lot of commentators look at this and they say, well, who, who is this Abram? And why was he chosen to hear the word of God? Why was he the one chosen to embark upon this mission of creating a, a, a new nation and walking an entirely different path than the, the path that people had walked before him? And so there's a lot of Midrashim kind of trying to ex understand why uh, Abram was chosen. And one Midrash, uh, uh, which we find in Genesis Rabbah goes like this, Rabbi Isaac said, ah, this may be compared to a man who is traveling from place to place when he saw a bira doleket. And bira doleket is typically translated 
as a palace in flames. So in this uh, reading of the Midrash, the idea is that Abraham is, is wandering around and he sees a, a palace in flames and wonders, my goodness, it's such a beautiful palace. It's, in, it's uh, threatened with destruction. Surely there's an owner of the palace who would want to make sure that it's not destroyed. I wonder where the owner is. And that's when God's voice enters into Abraham's life and says, I am the owner of the palace. And so it's interesting. Um, well, let me get to the second understanding of this same Midrash. And this is from a contemporary com commentator, I, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, who said, ah, this, this phrase, bira doleket, can also be read as a palace full of light. So in one interpretation, it's a palace inflamed and in threatened with destruction. In Rabbi Heschel's view, ah, it's a palace that is full of illumination and, and it's beautiful. So on the one hand, these two different interpretations of this phrase, bira doleket, kind of could indicate two very different approaches to the wonderment of the world. Uh, one person who sees it's a beautiful world, but it's, it's threatened with destruction, uh, what's going on here. And then the other, Rabbi Heschel said, ah, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful radiant world. It's, it's magnificent. Even within those two different choices of understanding, perhaps different personality choices, they may be indicating different types of personalities. One who becomes aware of the world around him when it's kind of threatened with destruction. That's when the person suddenly becomes aware of how magnificent the world is and it's about to be lost. And another personality type who is perhaps a sunnier personality, who, who just responds to the, to the beauty of the world. And, and then that opens up a new possibility to that person. Now, even within those two different personality uh, responses uh, to a building full of some kind of light, there are two different paths that each of those individuals could choose. The first one, the one who sees the, the place being en engulfed in flames and threatened with destructions, could either say, um, everything is falling apart, so what's the point of doing anything? The government is falling apart, my neighbors don't keep their yard clean. Why should I keep my yard clean? Why should I vote? Everything is just full of corruption and destruction. Or the person could respond by seeing everything being threatened with destruction by saying, ah, I better do something. I better clean up the street. I better talk to my neighbor about keeping things cleaner. Ah, I better make sure that more people register to vote. So, so even within seeing everything being threatened with destruction, there are choices to be made. The same thing can be said of Rabbi Heschel's uh, personality, who's the personality who responds to the, to the radiant beauty in the world. Uh, one response from that person could be, how beautiful everything is. Uh, everything's being well taken care of. I don't need to do a thing. Uh, or that person could say, Wow, everything is so beautiful. I want to make sure it stays that way. And so I want to help take care of it. So I want to explore this notion about uh, radiance and fire and flames and how that opens up multiple possibilities of not only how to res what the flames mean, but how to respond to them. If we... Uh, look at the painting by Yoram Ra'anan, um, we have this bit of a commentary uh, from our artist in number two on the study sheet. It says, the essence of the menorah and its lights is in the sphere of Bina, which is likened to a palace of mirrors that reflects and multiplies the pure light of Chochmah, 
the flow of insight and holy inspiration. So here our artist is referring to uh, two of the Sifirot and the Kabbalistic system. And uh, the second one he refers to, Chokhmah, that is considered really the, um, this, this receipt of the unitary flow of light uh, from the source of everything. Uh, and it is likened to kind of a, an explosion uh, of insight, uh, undifferentiated insight. Just you, just you can't even put into words what you've experienced, but you know you've experienced something and you, you've assimilated it. And then the next uh, sefira called Bina, which flows from Chokmah, that's where the mind begins to uh, make sense of it all and begins to draw from this flood of inspiration uh, in, in, to creating uh, something that um, is operational, if you will. Those who are involved in intellectual property, you can think of it along the lines of someone has an idea uh, for something, but it's really not usable and patentable until you uh, till you begin to draw blueprints, until you begin to draw specifications, until you can make it something that's tangible, concrete, and identifiable. So, so this notion that uh, our artist is is conveying here about the menorah is being in the the realm of a palace of mirrors that reflects and multiplies the pure light of Chokhmah. So in this system of Kabbalah, what, what he's conveying is we have this infusion of, of divine light from an initial source, which in that system is called Keter, which can, is also sometimes called nowhere. This uh, infusion of light into Chokhmah with, with this explosion of, of intuitive brightness. And then from there, it shifts and becomes differentiated and uh, more uh, broken down in, into its component parts. And that's what's happening here. It is as if a light is now going through a prism and is being refracted uh, into many, many different components. I wanna suggest this, this theme of refraction multiplication, uh, multiplicity is a theme that we're going to see played out throughout the entire book of Numbers, which makes it somewhat unique from the books that have preceded it. Um, and we're going to see personalities more than in any other book, we're gonna see a nation of personalities, if you will, uh, begin to emerge. And there's gonna be some confusion as to oh, who's the hero and who's the villain, if you will. And I, I wanna suggest that the book of Numbers is intentionally trying, going to try and blur for us any kind of rigid distinction between hero and villain. It's going to try and show us that there's some merit and there's some demerit, if you will, in, in all of us and in all of these characters. And that notion is conveyed in this verse from Ecclesiastes. There is no righteous person on earth who does not sin. And in our Torah portion, we see these uh, characters uh, who have done so much. Uh, Miriam, who has been the source of both inspiration and by tradition, she's been the source uh, of, of being able to find uh, water in the desert. Uh, she's the one who uh, helped save her, her younger brother Moses uh, from death. Uh, she made sure that he survived and, and had uh, uh, un, was taken care of while in the palace. So Aaron and uh, Miriam cry out, oh, he, Moses, married a Cushite woman. Righteous people who say something so terrible, how could that be? And then we have uh, Yosef Albo, who was a rabbi in uh, 15th century Spain, who said something, a slight variation on what Ecclesiastes said. He said, there is no righteous person on earth who, 
in doing good does not sin. In other words, sometimes even when we do Absolutely. the right thing, maybe for the right reason, we can, we can cause injury. And in a, what we're going to see in one of our upcoming Torah portions is Moses is an example of this. We're going to read in chapter 20. Moses raised his hand and struck the right rock twice with his rod. Out came copious water and the community and the beast drank. Moses did, uh, the result of what he did was good, right? He, he brought water uh, to people that, that were thirsty. The problem is he did it in a way that was also harmful. So he was doing good by bringing water out, but he committed some kind of transgression beca because of the way he did it. So uh, I want to suggest that Book of Numbers is a, as a case study or perhaps a cautionary tale uh, about the dangers of only seeking perfection. If we are only seeking perfection in others or in ourselves, uh, we're, we're, we're doomed uh, to a life of, of cynicism and, and lack of fulfillment. The book of Numbers, I want to suggest, is preparing the Israelites in the narrative and us who are also on this journey uh, to realize that it's not perfection that, that we seek. Uh, it's the capacity to deal with imperfection and to constantly understand the source uh, of our messiness and our, and our transgressions and the capacity uh, to, to learn from them and, and overcome them. Um, if you turn over the sheet, I have uh, a couple of quotes from Brian Stevenson. Brian Stevenson is a lawyer. I believe he teaches uh, right now at NYU Law School. Uh, and he is the founder of an organization called Equal, the Equal Justice Initiative. And he's written a book, he wrote a book called Just Mercy, which is a book about his career as a, as a lawyer representing the marginalized uh, and the underrepresented and in particular, it focuses on one individual whom he represented who had been uh, convicted of murder. Uh, and eventually he, they are able to prove that uh, he didn't commit the murder and he was eventually released uh, from prison. But the whole book is about his, his career in, in representing um, the, un, the marginal and, and the underrepresented. And in that book, he writes, each of us is more than the worst thing we've ever done. Uh, he's, Brian Stevens uh, committed himself uh, to dealing with uh, how the United States handles uh, uh, incarceration and whether that's a good thing or a bad thing and the capacity to see in everyone something more than the worst thing that they've ever done. And then he says something else interesting. He says, if you are willing to get closer to people who are suffering, you will find the power to change the world. I read that and I didn't know exactly what he meant. And so I, I open it up to you to, if you can help me to understand, because I'm not sure if he means you will find the power to change the world, meaning that you'll discover in those who are suffering a power to change the world. Or if he means if you uh, ally yourself, immerse yourself in the world of sufferers, then you become a more powerful person. So uh, this notion about um, th this uh, lack of rigidity between uh, who are heroes and who are villains uh, is stands in stark contrast to kind of the image that we were getting as we were reading the book of Leviticus, which takes a pretty clear, bright line between 
uh, that which is holy and that which is unholy, that which is pure and that which is unpure, those who are priests and those who are non-priests. Here, the book of Numbers uh, leaves behind that kind of um, prescriptive approach to teaching uh, and enters in, back into the world of human narrative and finds a much messier world than the more abstract prescriptive world uh, of the book of Leviticus. And it wants to assure us that yes, human life is messier than, than rules, than the world of rules, but we also have the capacity uh, to learn from our messiness and to, uh, and in fact, that's essential if we're gonna be on a journey to the land of promise. So here in this week's Torah portion, um, you, you read that uh, the people are hungry and Moses complains about not being able uh, to, to feed them. And Moses says, could enough flocks and herds be slaughtered to suffice them all? And then God answered to Moses, is there a limit to the power of Adonai? Now, when I read that, I said, well, what exactly is the power of, of Adonai? Uh, because right after uh, those verses, um, it doesn't say all this food came about. Right after these verses, is there a limit to the power of Adonai? We get this little bit of narrative about Moses going out, finding 70 people, and these 70 people then becoming infused with the a uh, prophetic spirit of God and Eldad and Medad uh, continuing to prophesy and Joshua going to Moses, said, oh my gosh, you, you need to stop them from doing that. They're, they're taking over your job. And Moses goes, isn't that great? I, 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 wish, I, I wish everyone could do that. So is the power, when it says, is there a limit to the power of Adonai, is that referring to the power of God to, to rain a quail upon the people and bring about more food? Or is the power of Adonai to, to generate within more people insight, engagement, wisdom, a desire and a willingness to share in the responsibility of a community? I want to conclude uh, with words from uh, the great uh, uh, monk, uh, mid 20th century, uh, Thomas Merton, who wrote, uh, there is in all things a hidden wholeness. If we go back to our painting, Spreading the Light, uh, I noticed that the canvas on which our artist paints the menorah begins with a subsurface of kind of dull and brown colored paint. And then eventually uh, this bright glowing object begins to appear. It is almost as if the artist saw in his underlayment of brown paint, this object, this gold bright shining object, and he was helped to, to bring it to the surface. And I think that's, in a sense, what the book of Numbers is trying to do. It's telling us, all of us, even the greatest among us, commit transgressions. And even the most problematic among us have a, a point of view that's worth listening to, which we'll encounter as we go through the book of Numbers. And the, our object is not to... Uh, to seek to avoid the messiness and of our lives and our imperfections. It's to dig into it, uh, because when we do that, who knows, we might be able to bring forward a bright shining light. With that, I'd love to open it up for our conversation and, and uh, hear what you, what you saw within our Torah portion. Yes, June, go ahead and un unmute and share with us. Hi. on the. Um... One by Brian Stevenson got to me, if you're willing to get closer to the people who are suffering, you will find the power to change the world. Co brings to mind 
if you walk in someone else's shoes or until you walk in someone else's shoes, you really don't know what they're experiencing. Mm -hmm. And once you do walk in their shoes, maybe you can find a solution to the problem. And uh, I think that's what the power to change the world is talking about that, you know, we always condemn other people to things that we really don't quite fully understand unless we're in their shoes. Nice. Nice. Very nice. Thank you, June. Okay. Uh, let me go to Jay and then Paul. Hi. I, I envision in the painting a chalice that you can grasp and drink in all of this magnificence of uh, spectrums and light and bring it into your internal self. Uh, I, I, and I also, uh, on my uh, desktop uh, monitor, I rotated. Uh, very interesting. It, it, it reflects different things to me in the different rotations. Uh, uh, when I look at it. And the third thing is, uh, you really, when, when the artist says, I started with a brown background, you really don't know in this painting what is background and what is foreground. You, there's no, it's similar to our universe that we live in. That, uh, you know, we, we, we seek context in our lives. Uh, you're not going to find it in this painting. You have to seek it for yourselves. Oh, that's nice. Thank you, Jay. Okay. And, and let me invite Paul. Go ahead and unmute, Paul. Yeah, I'd like to uh, kind of back up a little bit what June said, and that, uh, you know, if, if you ask a, a homeless person whether he wants to eat, you know, uh, something very fancy or whatever, or, uh, or be very ph philosophical about, you know, the infusion of Kabbalah type ideas, the homeless person just, it depends on the person you're asking what the answer you're gonna get. Uh, if on the other hand, you ask a scholar the same question, uh, the food just kind of goes away because chances are he's married to somebody who's working. So there's a different, uh, you get a different answer for different people. Um, and, and what about that different answer for different people? What, what, what does that mean? Does it mean that things are just relative or does it, what does that mean? Yeah, I, I think it, I, I think it's, you got the, my point anyway. I, I think it's relative that from what position in life you come from, you, you focus on your need. You know, the person who is hungry is going to focus on the food. The person who is comfortable, he is able to reach out to more lofty aspirations. And go ahead, Richard. Well, as Stevenson says there, if you're not afraid, if you can, if you can draw next to a person, it's about the change in the inter, uh, the person who enters next to the person who's hurting. That's the important piece to what he's saying. If you are overcoming your fear to sit with that person, it's gonna help abate whatever fear they're suffering that has led to their, their disability. And likewise, I see a parallel between that and the burning house and the palace that I can imagine someone saying, Moses goes by, and we've said that. Well, he sees a bird, somebody doesn't take care of it. Well, because he sees both the burning house and he sees the, the, the palace, and he's responding to, I want to make that bring out the palace in me. Mm -hmm. Don't bring out the fear in me. And that, uh, so we have this tremendous. Uh, so-called failure or upset in our life now with the uh, environment, with the civil war that's going on here and in Ukraine, with the shenanigans in Washington. And we can get way upset about it, or we can say, wait a minute, this is a light being shown on all that's happening. If I'm not afraid of this, there may be a way in which my discourse 
can help change the world because I don't get into the wrestling match about it, but do some small thing to put water on the fire or to enlighten. It's, it's scary to think that people who are watching the uh, report from the committee will only, many of them will only tax themselves with cognitive dissonance to try and maintain their psychotic idea about being out of reality. And we don't know what will happen, but if I can calm myself down a little bit, I can have hope that no, this is a time when we're facing the nature of man and how we respond to it. This is a palace to be born now. This is a palace to be here when so many good people are doing so many good things and, and getting and fleshing out the true facts. It's a hard road to hold, but if I don't get cynical about it and I'm not afraid to wade in and sit with the people, <laughs> yeah, maybe that will help save the world. Wow. Thank you. Um, I have uh, Robert and Mark, David, Susan, and Margot. Go ahead, Robert. Thank you so much. Wonderful. And I'll be brief because I know others want to speak. I believe there's a relationship between suffering and godliness. <coughs> People who have never had hardship are never content. And if you want to see godly people, and I've lived in different cultures, a few at least, those folks who have suffered understand contentment in a way that many of us don't and a relationship with their creator that many of us don't. And turning to my own tradition, which is Baha'i, there's a, a verse I love and I want to share it with you because I think it, it speaks in lofty language to the role of suffering if we allow it to transform us like a burnish. If adverse, O oh son of man, if adversity befall thee not in my path, how canst thou walk in the ways of them that are content with my pleasure? If trials afflict thee not in thy longing to meet me, how wilt thou attain the light in thy love for my beauty? Anybody can claim anything when life is easy. But when those who have suffered, and I think anyone who's Jewish understands what that means. And if you know what the Baha'is are going through in Iran, this group understands what that means. It can easily, if we allow it, draw us closer to our creator because all the veils disappear. We realize everything is like a shadow, an illusion, but the reality of God, and if it shines in us, that is real. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, and Mark. Um, I love the, the conversation about uh, light. I would like to pursue that a little bit because um, you've talked about this palace of light and how the light is refracted and there are many aspects of our personality um, that can be realized um, by this and through this light. Uh, getting back to the question of um, dealing with a person who is suffering and if we can put ourselves, as June was saying, in their shoes, um, might, that, might that not make us a, a better person? And I'm thinking of another kind of light, not refraction, but reflection. Um, and Robert will appreciate this being a, a lover of uh, optics as well. But when light is reflected, it's coming back to you as opposed to being dispersed with a refracted light. So if I'm looking at a person who's suffering, and somehow I can see within that person a part of myself. Then maybe we have a chance to improve not only that person, but ourselves and the world. Lovely. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Lovely. Uh, David, Susan, then Margot, then Catherine. So um, I think many can see needs can see people that are that need help, that need caring for, that need love, that need affection. But what I get from the way this was phrased, if you are willing to get closer to people who are suffering, you will find the power to change the world. It's where you get so close that you're no longer othering. 
They're not the other. They're you. Yeah. Thank you. That's uh, thank you. I hadn't seen that. Thank you. And then uh, Margo. On a very simple note, because I always come up with the simple things. I think there's a real conflict within, well, within me, between my perception of myself and other people's perception of me. And for that, I have a little story. When my son was about eight years old, I was punishing him for something. And he began whimpering. And I said, why are you whimpering? He said, I don't know how I'm going to tell my friends. They all think you're so nice. <laughs> Thank you, Margo. Precious. That's precious. Thank you. Ed Catherine. OK, um, to get back to this phrase that Brian Stevenson came up with, um, I think the, that the pivotal word in here is find. And what does find mean? Um, because I think I think that if we take it as something definitive, that might seem too easy. But if we take it as you will discern the power, you will be able to see the power to change the world. That's at least the beginning that we can that we can wrestle with. Um, but it takes a few steps to get there. <laughs> So there's no automatic finding, it's just being able to see and then to seek out that power. Wow, 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 wow. Um, um, that, that's just so great. Um, it, 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 make me, um, it makes me think of Shabbat and then Chavdalah. Uh, Shabbat is supposed to be this moment when we have everything that we need. Everything, everything is is complete and peaceful and fulfilled, and it's it's a moment uh, outside of time, if you will. Uh, and then we have Chavdalah, and Chavdalah can be understood in our kind of uh, Kabbalistic uh, system here as being that moment of discernment of being able of starting to carve out something from the wholeness into the distinctions. And the wholeness is lovely, but the wholeness is there for the purpose of our being able to start going back into the rest of the week. Uh, and so it is, if Shabbat is, is a recharging uh, our souls and ourselves with uh, the fullness that is available to us. And then we take that and, and then we begin to go back into the week with this sense of discernment and distinction and differentiation. And that's, that's kind of what the way this Kabbalistic flow works, if you will. And, and then I, I want to also acknowledge uh, what you all gave me in this reading tonight is we get to the beginning of chapter 11 that talks about uh, there were people who took to complaining bitterly. Uh, <clears throat> and it's um, the description says that uh, a fire uh, of God broke out against them starting at the, at the outskirts of the camp. So it's as if there is this uh, dissension uh, that's happening kind of at the edges of the camp rather than in the centers of it. Um, and then immediately after that happens, we have this riffraff that's described and the riffraff felt a gluttonous craving. So this notion that it is almost as if this unwarranted or baseless sense of grievance uh, then leads to a kind of a physical manifestation, which is this uh, craving, a, 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 a craving that almost cannot be satisfied. It, it, it requires uh, food coming out of their nostrils before they begin to recognize uh, that they have enough food to eat. So 
uh, I hadn't seen that connection before between the sense of grievance and the sense of kind of uh, this pathology of, of craving. You know, the, the Ten Commandments ends with the commandment, you shall not covet uh, your neighbor's ass or anything that is of your neighbor's. And there's a beautiful commentary that says, ah, oh, that's not really a commandment, that's a promise. That if you live in accordance with the preceding nine, if you live a life of morality and, and honor and dignity and, and respect, what you'll end up with is a life in which you, you feel no lack of anything. You will feel complete. You will not have this ongoing, unsatisfiable sense of craving for uh, what, what you don't have. So uh, I want to thank each one of you for, for coming together to have this study and uh, to, to remind me uh, that there's a way of life that we're embarked upon that leads to, to a sense of fulfillment and, and peace. And as this Torah portion mentions, it has to do, as our artist says, with this light being a palace of mirrors where we begin to see beyond the singularity or the one dimensionality uh, of anyone who's before us, that we see the complexity uh, of those who are before us and hopefully also see the complexity of ourselves and our kind to ourselves as well. And when we're able to do that, uh, then we'll have a successful journey and be able to build this great uh, world of promise. With that, I want to thank each and every one of you. Uh, God bless you all, and I look forward to our next gathering. Be well. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Mark, I'm going to call you. Okay. <laughs>